The Anderfels are a land of shocking extremes. It is the most desolate place in all the world, for two blights have left great expanses of the steppes so completely devoid of life that corpses cannot even decay there. No insect or grub will ever reach them. It is a land filled with wonders like the Murdane with its gigantic white statue of Our Lady carved into its face, her hands outstretched and bearing an eternal flame, or Weishaupt Fortress with its walls of living rock towering over the desolate plains below. The Anders too are a people of extremes, the most devout priests and the most deadly soldiers, the poorest nation in the world and the most feared. Welcome, welcome once again, my dear students, to another lesson of Dragon Age, the history and lore of Thedas, with me, Professor Absalom. Today's subject will cover one of the northern nations of Thedas, famed for its harsh climate, its resilient, pious people, as well as being the center of the Grey Warden Order on the continent. The Kingdom of the Anderfels. Without further ado, let us begin. In the northwestern corner of Thedas lies the nation of the Anderfels. Its climate warm and arid, much of the country is covered in steppes, wastelands, and deserts. This harsh environment is in large part a result of the numerous blights that have hit the land very hard in the past, of which I will speak of in a little while. It is a desolate and harsh wasteland that covers most of the nation, its ground and earth colored red. Summers are infamously hot and hazardous in the Anderfels, and the regular occurrence of dust storms sweeping across much of the land during the other seasons of the year makes the prospect of maintaining agriculture an impossibility. The mountainous regions of the Wandering Hills and the Weathered Pass marks the northern border of the Anderfels towards the jungles of the Donarchs. To the south and southwest, the mighty Hunterhorn Mountains and the Blasted Hills marks the southern edge of the country, bordering Orlay and the recently rediscovered Dwarven Taig of Kalsharok underground. The Tevinter Imperium border the country on its eastern side. Although the nation is sparsely populated, several minor towns and settlements are spread around the vast country, like the town of Nordbotten, close to the cliffs and mountains of the Murdane, along with Kassel, Tallow, and Sundarin, along the coast of the Colean Sea to the northeast. At the center of the country lies the capital of Hosburg. A major point of interest regarding the Anderfels is of course also the Grey Warden headquarters of Weishaupt Fortress to the southeast of the capital. To the west, the only settlement of note in this mainly uninhabited region is the remote port town of Leish, on the coast of the Volca Sea. Beyond the northern borders of the Anderfels, up towards the jungles to the northeast, lies interestingly enough a Cunari colony by the name of Cundalon, and straight through the nation, winding its way past minor settlements as well as the capital, is the Latinfluss River. Being one of the most inhospitable and harsh nations in Thedas in regards to its nature and climate, this fact has bred a very unique society in the Anderfels. Aside from a few larger cities, the Anders, as the people of the Anderfels are called, live in small outposts and villages that are more or less self-sufficient. Due to the effects of previous blights on the land, very little grows in the Anderfels. What can and cannot be eaten in this land is taught to the Anders early in their childhood, as a means of survival. Even the ham tastes of despair if it comes from the Anderfels, as has been noted by several Thedosians not of Ander heritage. What little that do grow, grows very poorly in the nation. 
apples, small and bitter though they might be, and sour berries made edible only by adding vast amounts of honey can be found, however. And Ander thanks the maker for his luck every time he is able to get his hands on other fruits from the rest of Thedas, normally by trade. Dried fruits from Antiva and Orlay are often used by the Anders to make sweet-tasting fruit stews, a dish much appreciated and cherished by the nation's deprived people. In the poorest villages, it is said that the stew is served only during special occasions, and whole families savour every spoonful from a small pot of the dish. While officially a monarchy ruled by a king or queen from the capital of Hosburg, the monarch rarely bothers with anything else than the safety of himself and the city in which he resides. This and the fact that it is far away from its civilized neighbors and the rest of Thedas have led to the everyday men and women of the Anderfels learning how to fend for themselves very early on in their history. This also extends to the threat of the Darkspawn, a threat that is constant to the nation's people even during times of no blight. Aside from the dwarves underground, the Anderfels is the only country on Thedas who has to fight against the blighted creatures on a regular basis, as they often tend to surface in minor packs within the nation's borders and take advantage of the already blighted land. This has resulted in a very peculiar and unique mentality and culture for the Anders. Their harsh and blighted land forces them to be self-reliant and prioritize survival and hard work. Here in this desolate land, unlike much of the rest of the continent, a man's actions and accomplishments are more important than his name or lineage. The people cannot count on help from outside forces or the protection of the faraway king in the capital reaching them in time if something goes wrong in the outpost or the village. From childhood, they have also been told terrible tales of the Darkspawn, and many of them have to defend their homes against the creatures as they reach adulthood. A life of constant struggle for survival always fearful and on edge for what the dust storms or the dark nights might bring. Despite these less than ideal living conditions, or maybe because of them, the Anders are a fiercely religious folk, and among them can be found some of the most devout followers of the Chant of Light in Thedas. The faith of Andraste is strong in the Anderfels, and the Orlesian Chantry is incredibly influential within the borders of the nation. Religious customs and practices among the Anders varies little from the rest of Thedas, with a few notable exceptions. As in Tevinter and Orlay, the people of the Anderfels cremate their dead and raise cairns to remember the departed by. Normally, the weapons of the person in question, if they had any, will be left in the cairn, but this practice is ignored in the Anderfels. The Anders reason that weapons are far too valuable to be left with the dead, and that the living will have more use for the weapons than the deceased, and this sentiment can be understood in a land as dangerous as theirs. Facing harsh living conditions, poverty, and even the result of mankind's second sin, the Darkspawn, on a daily basis, the Anders dedicate much of their lives to praying and seeking guidance from Andraste's teachings and the Chant of Light. So fervent and pious is the common people of the Anderfels that it puts the faithful of other countries to shame, and even travelling clerics from faraway lands visiting the nation are surprised by the zealous nature of many Anders faithful. This is also very much reflected in the nation's laws which are far from secular in nature. For those who break the king's laws, and in extension, the maker's laws, he or she can face harsh punishments and even be put to death in the nation's capital. This enforcement of religious laws goes so far that the king can order assassinations of people who have fallen into decadence and sin and broken the maker's holy laws. This is not called assassinations, of course, but absolution, as the sinner pays for his religious crimes with his life and is absolved of his sins in death. 
This brutal religious tyranny is carried out by a cadre of assassins that answers only to the king's command, and carries out his will and justice. For in Anderfell's politics, plotting and scheming for power is all well and good, but the worst thing you can do is to disgrace yourself in the eyes of the pious men and women around you, for that will put you in the crosshairs of the king's own tribunals, and your lack of faith might lead to your untimely demise. Aside from the less pleasant aspects of Anderfell's culture, there is one cultural facet that has given the nation and its people international fame and praise. Something that the Anders can truly be proud of, namely the skill of their artists and the beauty of their art. Art from the Anderfels is known to be of the highest quality and craftsmanship. Although sculptures are the most sought after objects, paintings made by Ander masters are also very popular. So popular in fact that a special Ander style of portraiture painting have sprung up over the long centuries. The vast majority of art created by the Anders are, due to their pious culture, religiously inspired. Andraste and her disciples, important religious figures as well as parts from the Chant of Light and so on, are common motifs for Anderfell artists. In the other nations of Thedas, sculptures from the Anderfells are highly sought after, especially among the wealthy nobles of Orlais, who are known to pay enormous amounts of gold for their desired art pieces. There are also several famous statues and sculptures of religious significance within the Anderfells that are the centre of pilgrimages and visitations from faraway lands. The most famous of these creations is without a doubt Our Lady of the Anderfells, mentioned by Genetivi in the introductory quote. This enormous white statue depicts the prophet Andraste bearing an eternal flame in her outstretched hands, and is carved straight into the mountainside of the Myrdane. Since the road to the statue is fraught with all the different natural dangers that the Anderfels is associated with, very few pilgrims have actually made the perilous journey to see the statue with their own eyes. But those who have, has spread the word of its wondrous beauty to all the corners of the continent. As you might imagine from all of this, there have been many talented Ander masters of artistry throughout the centuries. And one of the most recent artistic stars from the Anderfels is one very talented and very pious artist by the name of Griselda Reiniger. Her art piece, The Chant of Light, depicting Andraste playing a harp on the night before her execution, won the annual art contest held by the University of Orlais. Considered, quote, both a stroke of inspirational genius and a masterwork portrait from one of the most traditional painting schools, end quote, according to critics, this has given both the traditional and her portrait style a resurgence, and at the same time, catapulted Reiniger's career to the skies, as she has now become one of the most sought after artists on the continent. Because of her piety, she has gained the support of the Chantry, and been offered many contracts from chantries across Thedas, as well as contracts from wealthy patrons longing for one of her portraits as their own. Lady Reiniger can, overall, count herself lucky, as her talent will earn her much fame and far more wealth than is sadly normal for Anders artists. Indeed, it is a well-known fact and controversy in the nation that even though many buyers will pay large sums of gold for Ander art, the artists themselves rarely receive even a fraction of this money. Instead, much of the proceeds are absorbed by the disreputable members of the Anderfels local Dwarven Merchants Guild as handling fees, much to the anger of the Anderfell artists. Since the monarch of the nation is often more inclined to uphold relative safety, order and comfort in the capital instead of in the rest of the country, the everyday people of the Anderfels often turn to another local power when it comes to protection and leadership, namely the Grey Wardens. 
See my previous lesson on the Grey Wardens and the Darkspawn for more info on them specifically. Ever since the First Blight, this military order has had a strong presence in the Anderfelds, with the organization's headquarters being situated at Weishaupt Fortress southeast of Hosberg. The Wardens have managed to retain their power and influence here, as opposed to many other countries in Thedas, where the impact of the few local Wardens and their Warden commanders have lessened in the centuries between the Fourth and Fifth Blight. This is not only apparent in the political power that the Wardens in the Anderfelds wield, easily the equivalent of high nobility in terms of might and influence, but also militarily, as there are more than a thousand Wardens stationed in the Anderfelds, at least in 931 Dragon, compared to the other nations of Thedas, where the number of troops varies from a few dozen Wardens up to a hundred per nation. The leader of the Order, the First Warden, has largely been reduced to a figurehead rather than an effective leader over the years. This has become the case due to the awkward political situation that the Wardens find themselves in with the nation that houses their headquarters. The ruling monarch and other political leaders in the Anderfels are well aware of the great military and societal benefits of having the Wardens act independently within the nation, yet at the same time, they do not want to grant them too much leeway, as they are acting within the borders of another sovereign nation, and could become a threat if given too much power. This creates a bit of a precarious situation between the nation and the Order, and to balance this out, the First Warden acts as one of the King's closest advisors when it comes to matters of state. This not only alleviates some of the King's work, but also keeps the First Warden close to the Monarch, so that he knows exactly what the Warden is up to. Overall, the ordinary people of the Anderfels greatly appreciate the presence of the Wardens in their country. The Order's soldiers, more so than their faraway king, help ordinary people to defend themselves against the Darkspawn and help them to survive their day-to-day -day lives. The friendship and alliance that exists between the Anders and the Wardens stretches back all the way to the time of the First Blight, where they fought and died together for the very first time. The names Genlock and Herlock, signifying different types of Darkspawn, comes from the Anderfels version of the common tongue, called Ander. Since the Anders were the first humans to fight the Darkspawn back in the day, they were also the first people to categorize them in their own language. Aside from the harsh deserts and the grand statues of Andraste, one of the most intriguing and mysterious parts of the Anderfels can be found in its western region. On the shores of the Volca Sea, at the very edge of the known world, sits a solitary port town by the name of Laish. Though it might not look like much today, this town was once a thriving trade hub built for a single purpose, to receive and trade with ships coming from across the Volca Sea, beyond the borders of Thedas. These foreign traders were, according to the legends and tales of the Anders, known as the Voshai, not much is known about the Voshai or the mysterious lands that they came from. What we do know today comes as mentioned from Anders' legends and tales that are hundreds of years old, but much of it have been transcribed and retold to us by the diligent Brother Genitivi. In his volume 2 of In Pursuit of Knowledge, The Travels of a Chantry Scholar, Genitivi tells us that the Voshai's strange cargo ships were filled to the brim with all types of exotic wares and spices that were completely unknown to Thedosians, and the newcomers traded these rare goods with the merchants of Laish. One of the most sought after materials by the Voshai was lyrium. Genitivi even goes so far as to say that they were, quote, almost obsessively interested in acquiring lyrium, end quote. Apart from this, the Voshai traders that visited Laish during this time seemed to not be the most courteous of people, hostile and rude, and only interested in learning the king's tongue for the purpose of bartering and trading, never 
for any type of interaction or cultural exchange. Another intriguing detail about these traders is that according to the old tales, all of the cargo ships were captained by dwarves, perhaps alluding to some kind of elevated status for dwarves within Voshai culture, or at least its seafaring culture. An interesting note is also that no elves were ever sighted on these Voshai ships, according to the old tales. Due to this lucrative trade, Leish prospered during many centuries until suddenly, in the early Black Age, the Voshai trade ships stopped coming. It is unknown exactly what caused the sudden stop in trade traffic from across the Volca Sea, and without this essential trade, the port of Leish quickly fell into ruin, and today the village is a shadow of its former self, its inhabitants having not seen trade from across the sea in centuries, and are now eking out a lonely existence at the edge of the known world. Supplies and goods are still brought to the distant port by caravan, however, and acts as a lifeline for the largely isolated town to the rest of the world. Brought to Leish through the dangerous wandering hills, and protected by the famous marksmen of the Green Men Order, the caravans still connect Leish to the rest of the Anderfels. Attempts were made to try and re-establish the trade from the Theodosian side, though not from the inhabitants of Leish itself, due to its port not being efficient enough to construct big and sturdy trading vessels that could travel long distances. This interest came from outside the Anderfels borders, as sometime after the trade evaporated, a group of Tevinter merchant houses pulled their ships and resources together in order to try and mount an expedition from Leish. Their goal was ultimately to try and sail across the Volca Sea to the supposed homeland of the Voshai and re-establish the lucrative trade traffic. Sadly, the expedition ended in failure, as none of the Tevinter ships ever returned from their journey across the sea. There have been rumours, however, during recent years, that the long-lost Voshai traders might finally have returned to Leish, but this time for an entirely different reason. From Genetivi's works, quote, Reports in recent years suggest the Voshai ships may have returned to Leish, supposedly carrying tales of a massive cataclysm in their homeland, the reason for their absence, perhaps, though the truth of these reports is questionable at best." End quote. Let us now move on to a summary of the Anderfeld's history, and we start as far back as we can, in Theda's ancient past. Before the nation of the Anderfels existed, the land was known as Orthland, and the ancestors of the Anders were known as the Orth. After the fall of Arlathan in minus 975 ancient, the Tevinter Imperium expanded massively across Thedas, conquering and subjugating many other human peoples and tribes. The Orth were among these conquered peoples, and Orthland was assimilated into the Imperium under the new name of Western Tevinter. One can safely say that by the time of Archon Almadrius's ascension to Tevinter's throne in minus 760 ancient, what would become the Anderfels was a fully controlled and integrated province in the Imperium. But this rule would not be indefinite, as it would turn out. Prior to the assassination of Archon Almadrius in minus 692 Ancient, and the civil war that would follow as a result of his apprentice Tedarian seizing the throne, Western Tevinter would split from the larger Imperium and declare independence under a new name, the Anderfels. After splitting from Tevinter in minus 695 Ancient, the Anderfels enjoyed freedom and independence for 160 years, until the Imperium decided to strike back in minus 535 Ancient. Having recovered from its long periods of civil war, Tevinter managed to reconquer the Anderfels, 
but not before facing stiff resistance from the ancient Anders. It was during this reconquest by Tevinter that the legendary warrior order of the Draska were born. The Draska were Ander warriors famed for their superb marksmanship with bow and arrow, as well as the fierce bite of their whirling blades. Though these warriors fought bravely, the Imperium would be victorious in the end, hunting the Draska relentlessly until the last living members of the Order fled into the southern blasted hills. Tevinter was once again in control of the Anderfels, but the rule of the Magisters would, as we now know, not last forever, and this would also, supposedly, not be the last time in Theodosian history where the Draska would become involved in the fate of the Anderfels. As I mentioned in the previous lecture on Tevinter, the Imperium was torn apart by the emergence of the Darkspawn during the First Blight, and the continent-spanning cataclysm did not leave the Anderfels unscathed, far from it. This would only be the first of several Blights that would destroy the climate and nature of the Anderfels to such an extent that the effects are still seen today in the blasted and barren steppes and deserts of the modern Anderfels. However, the First Blight was eventually defeated and driven back in large part due to several major events taking place in the Anderfels. One hundred years into the conflict, a group of veterans banded together in the southern Anderfels to form the Order of the Grey Wardens, and constructed Weishaupt Fortress in minus 305 Ancient. Created to oppose the Darkspawn and the Blights, the Grey Wardens also met with their first ever recorded victory against the Dark Forces in the Anderfels at a battle by the city of Nordbotten. It was also from the time of the First Blight that another order of warriors from the Anderfels has its origins, namely the previously mentioned Green Men. A hunter from the Murdain by the name of Grunsmann rose to fame in the Anderfels during the Blight, not only because of his skill with the bow, but also for saving the people of Hosberg from starvation by crossing the Darkspawn lines surrounding the city. An order of warriors was later founded in remembrance of Grunsmann's name, made up of some of the best marksmen the continent has ever seen, as it is still alive and active to this day. As the Darkspawn was pushed back and eventually defeated during the following century, the Anderfels and the rest of Thedas was saved. But the land had been ravaged by the effects of the Blight, and future cataclysms would only cement the new barren landscape of the Anderfels. Following the defeat of the Archdemon Dumat in minus 203 Ancient, and the end of the First Blight, the Tevinter Imperium still maintained its control of the Anderfels. The Imperium would, however, decline during the following centuries, and the Anders would get their chance to claim their freedom again eventually. In the year 105 Divine, roughly 200 years after the First Blight ended, another Blight started. This Second Blight would be arguably even more devastating for the Anderfels than the first one, since it broke out in the western mountains of the Anderfels, and the nation's capital of Hosberg was the first major city to be attacked by the Horde. Since it was still a province of the Imperium, the Anders expected that they at least could count on the support and armies of their overlords, but Tevinter did the exact opposite thing at the start of the New Blight, and completely abandoned the Anderfels to better defend the heartlands of the Imperium. This was considered a great betrayal by the Anders, and it is still remembered to this day as a source of great enmity between the two nations and their inhabitants. The nation of the Anders might have been completely wiped from the face of Thedas during this conflict had it not been for the timely intervention of the Orlesian Empire. During the start of the Divine Age, the newly crowned Emperor Cordelius Dracon was cementing his rule over the newly established nation of Orlais, as well as the spreading of the teachings of Andraste 
and the Chant of Light. As opposed to Tevinter, Dracon decided to aid the Anderfels during the Blight, which not only saved the country overall, but also aided the Grey Wardens, as the siege of their fortress of Weishaupt could be lifted in 133 Divine. The Anderfels were then absorbed into the Orlesian Empire, and the populace were converted to the now institutionalized teachings of the Chantry and Andrastianism. It was from this point onward that the Chant of Light firmly took root within the culture and society of the Anderfels, and the zealous nature of the Anders' faith only grew with the following ages. When Dracon died in 145 Divine, his son and heir Cordelius II did not manage to hold his father's empire together in the same competent manner as it had been created. Cordelius II also lacked his father's personal charisma and sound political mind, and this was exploited by the people of the Anderfels. Initially grateful for the aid given to them against the Darkspawn by the Orlesians when their former masters had simply abandoned them, and for spreading the word of the Maker to them, this goodwill was finite, however. And without the personality of Dracon to convince them otherwise, the Anders became more interested in having a nation of their own again than becoming a part of the Orlesian Empire. And so, 20 years into Cordelius II's reign, the Anderfels declared independence, as the politically weak emperor could do little to stop it. Rumors claim that the remnants of the Draska, the order of warriors that had opposed Tevinter's reconquest of the Anderfels in minus 535 Ancient, were instrumental in securing the country's independence from Orle. But this is very hard to verify. So at the end of the Second Blight in 195 Divine, and at the turning of the age, the Anderfels were once again a sovereign nation free from foreign occupation. As much as the history of the Anderfels is defined by the Blights, the third of its kind, taking place between 310 and 325 Towers, largely took place outside of the country's borders. Remaining largely unaffected, the nation was still the home of the Grey Warden Order and the seat of their headquarters, as the Grey Wardens in Weishaupt managed to convince both Orle and Tevinter to send aid during the Blight, as the Horde moved on from Western Thedas to Central Thedas and the Free Marshes, where it was eventually defeated. As for the following Darkspawn incursion, the Fourth Blight, the Anderfels were once again a direct victim of the conflict. Taking place between 512 and 524 Exalted, the Blight started in Eastern Thedas, and the Horde quickly made their way westwards, where Hosberg went through a grueling siege by the Darkspawn that lasted between seven and eight years. The siege saw the death of the Anders King Henault as he was slain by an ogre, and it was only due to the efforts of the Grey Wardens who took over much of the political responsibilities and powers after the king's death, that the siege could finally be lifted in 520. This blight, too, ended far away from the Anderfels' borders in 524 Exalted. As of the year 944 Dragon, the Anderfels is ruled by King Wilhelm Augustine, an exceedingly pious man, even for an Ander, as one inquisitorial ambassador puts it. The king's son and only heir, Prince Baldwin Augustine, is only six years old. Although the nation appears to be stable at this point in time, there are however disturbing rumours regarding the Grey Wardens within the nation's borders. After the conflict against Corypheus, all contact with Weishaupt Fortress have eventually ceased unexpectedly. Some claim that the Order has fractured and gone off in different directions. Others claim that several Warden factions now war against each other for control over the Order. Few of these rumours can be verified for now, and since no more news have come from the Anderfels concerning the state of Weishaupt and the Order, we will simply have to wait and see what has transpired in the distant north of Thedas. 
only time will tell what has and what will happen to the Grey Wardens and to the nation of the Anderfells. And on that note, we will conclude today's lecture. Next time, we will travel across the continent to the Kingdom of Ravain, so stay tuned for that. As always, I have been Professor Absalom, good luck with your studying, and I will see you all in the next lecture. Thank you all very much for watching this video. I have had a lot of real-life work to do during the summer, so that has been the main reason for the video taking so long to come out. So, for all of those who have been patiently waiting, here is your reward. I will also be releasing a special Flora and Fauna video in the near future to celebrate hitting 10,000 subscribers. Until next time, thank you all once again, and have a good one.